cracks everywhere. Imagine calling this place your home. There's mould there. Then imagine you've been sent here after years of physical and mental abuse from your partner. It's not even a window. I feel like I'm in prison. I don't even know when it's sunny or raining outside. This family lived their lives in this windowless room. I never thought that life would be like this, that my children suffer like this. Just four walls and a broken bathroom. This is the reality for some of Britain's most vulnerable. There's a crisis going on now that the people in power don't like to talk about. Tens of thousands of domestic abuse victims are being failed by the system. There's not nearly enough accommodation to house them after they've left their violent relationships. And the ones who manage to get shelter are moved into places that are barely livable, prisoners in their own homes. I've had cases where women have just given up and have gone back to their perpetrator. Our investigation reveals a broken system that seems to punish victims instead of helping them. On the ground, what you have found is the reality for the majority. I start my journey in the north of England. I'm meeting a woman who has just escaped after decades of abuse. Just obviously, just keep it down now. We're calling her Susan, not her real name, to protect her identity. She's in hiding now. This is a safe house. Hello, I'm Andy from Sky. We're invited in. Can you try and explain what it's like being stuck in that daily cycle of, of violence against you? When it got into like a regular thing, you knew what was coming. So I used to just take it and... Well, brace yourself. Brace myself, yeah. I mean, it could be anything, like, if the tea weren't done properly or he didn't get his tea first, um, or if I didn't walk the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning just to go and get him some alcohol, I'd get a beating. And how regular were they? Every day. And I stopped with that for 27 years. Um. So I got away from that. Then I was put in like hotels. He found me in um, one of the hotels in town. So I've been moved around from pillar to post since then. Susan's story is a familiar one for abuse victims. Only one in three are accepted into refuges because most are full or have closed due to government cuts. If they can't get in, the victims are placed into so-called temporary accommodation. It took Susan several weeks before she was moved into a small two-bedroom property, but it felt like anything but home. The room that we're in now, was there any furniture at all? There was nothing in here at all. There was no curtains, nothing, no carpets, nothing at all. It was just completely blank walls. So how, where did you sleep? I slept on the floor. Um, I did rip a bit of cardboard down to try and put on the floor um, and um, I used one of my dirty washing bin bags for a pillar <laughs> um, to make it more comfy. Did you have a quilt or...? No, I had no quilt, no blankets. You must be freezing. I was, um, but I put layers of clothes on. What did you do and how did you relax before this sofa was here? I sat on the floor. Doing what? Just sitting on the floor, twiggling my thumbs, um, just waiting for things to get and put in place and the gas, the electric, the furniture. Um, I couldn't do nothing else, really. Must have been awful. It was. That's so typical of so many stories. I mean, we could be listening to that every day when we speak to people. Really? It's, that's not... I, I, as horrific as that is, that's not unusual. Domestic violence is a huge problem, but housing um, it is not given the priority that we need to with regards to safeguarding. If we think about those statutory partners, we think, we think education, we think social care, we think health, but why is housing not included in that? Why is it not given a priority? Because actually, safeguarding has to be understood at a housing level as well. 
If anything is to change, then it must happen here. The government has pledged £125 million for emergency accommodation for domestic abuse victims this year. But campaigners say that's not nearly enough. And there are now more women needing help than ever before, according to the UK's largest abuse charity, Refuge. It's very, very serious. All mainstream political parties agree something needs to be done. The whole system is broken. And, um, and, and the government have a good line to say at the dispatch box and councils, no doubt, think that they're doing as much as they can. But in, in reality, this has to be a political priority. And if you do not stretch every muscle to deal with the entire system at every level, I'm afraid to say that you are happy to sit back and let vulnerable women and children live in dangerous and unsavoury accommodation that is not fit for human habitation. Women expect to come forward and uh, be provided with reasonable services and, and it's a big, huge thing to break free of such exploitation. And what they find is exactly what their perpetrator promised them. They find a system that doesn't believe them, that treats them like animals, that places them in dangerous situations and a huge amount of them will describe it as going from one hell to another. Izzy Mulholland is a lawyer who specialises in helping domestic abuse victims find suitable accommodation. Do you think that the law helps domestic abuse victims? I'm frustrated and angry almost daily because I'm having to defend people who shouldn't need defending. and. The most frustrating thing, and it seems ridiculous, is that we win. And that means that a local authority accepts that they're acting unlawfully. And we don't just win some of the times, we win almost all the time. And that is so frustrating because it means that if a lawyer gets involved, they will deliver the service that they always should deliver. But it just takes a lawyer to tell them to do it. And that is so frustrating because it just, my job shouldn't be necessary. There's more temporary accommodation facilities in London than anywhere else in the country. That means many women and their children are moved here from their hometowns. I've come to meet one of these young families in B&B accommodation in the capital. The law says vulnerable people shouldn't be at places like this one for more than six weeks. Hi as it's harmful to their physical and mental health. But Aisha and her three children have spent more than two years here, and there's no sign of that changing. You've got three beds here, but obviously there's, there's four of you. So you and the little one on here. There's mould there, mould everywhere. This, this drain doesn't even work. You can't even wash yourself some days. That's where the ants come from. This is no way to live. Can you describe your emotions when you actually first saw this room? When I first arrived, I thought I would receive some support. I was told I would only be here for a while before we got a new home, but we're still here. They're not supporting me or my children. We can't do anything in here. It's hard to explain how bad it is, I'm always tense. I haven't even got a house. It's really hard living here. My children can't get a good life here. Sometimes I feel like I'm living on the streets because I don't have a house. It's like I'm homeless. I feel like I'm in prison. I don't even know when it's sunny or raining outside. Have you tried to move somewhere else? Have you tried to tell people that you're not happy here? Yes, I tell the council all the time but they say I'm not high risk. Do you feel that you are high risk? Of course I am. All the time my children ask me, any news from the council? Do you ever regret leaving, even though that house was so violent? I never thought that life would be like this, that my children suffer like this. I will bear all the sufferings in the world, but I can't bear to see my children suffer. Aisha's 13-year-old son agreed to speak to me. When you first walked through these doors, what was your first reaction? Am I going to be staying here? Is this for real? 
This is an abomination. Basically, when I'm here, I just spend all my time in bed. I even eat in bed. Did you think that it would be possible to, to live in a room like this for two years? No, not at all. I've got asthma and I have to put up with cigarette smoke in the corridors all the time. What impact do you think living in this place has on your, on your mum? She must be walking around with a lot of weight on her shoulders. She must always be thinking, when are we going to move out of this place? What do you hope that the future holds for you? I just want a good place to live in. A place which is good for our health. Seeing my mother struggle is very, very painful. We asked the government for an interview with the minister about the testimonies we gathered. They said no one was available, but gave this statement. It is absolutely vital that victims of domestic abuse and their children across the country can access practical and emotional support to help them rebuild their lives in a safe environment. People often say to me, and I hear this again and again, I can get over the thing that happened to me, the trauma that happened to me. What I can't get over is how traumatising the process was for me and my family. You couldn't pinpoint this on, on, on one aspect. This is a systemic failing in safeguarding. Domestic abuse should be something that everybody's behind. I think we can all agree on it. Domestic abuse survivors should be helped when they need it. So why aren't they?